Hello, my name is Simon. Welcome to Why Is That, a free speech platform where we explore big ideas and the controversies of our time. Hello, beloveds, and welcome back to another episode of Why Is That. I seem to be cursed. Why? Why is that? <laughs> so, today was moving day, and the guest I had lined up tonight uh, pulled out. So, uh, so this show is Fake News Part 2, playing clips from YouTubers covering the uh, fake news phenomena. If you didn't catch last week's show, um, it was covered basically after the defeat of Hillary Clinton in the US election. The narrative that there is a lot of fake news out there that cost her the election. Also, Russian hacking, sexism, Bernie bros. Um, it's just not her fault. It's everyone else's fault. <laughs> Not that she was a horrible candidate that caught out being told so massive, massive lies. And, of course, beforehand, uh, the media narrative was conspiracy theories. La label somebody a conspiracy theorist. Don't have to listen to anything they have to say. Um, but, of course, that lost its uh, stigma, I suppose. And now it's fake news. So the uh, three YouTubers were, um, I'll be covering is Paul Joseph Watson, who's editor of InfoWars, uh, a uh, network that has been deemed conspiracy theorist and now has been deemed fake news, which seemed to point it out uh, pretty much all the lies in the Hillary campaign and general media narratives. There's also Abby Martin, who has her own channel, um, but the clip I'm going to play is the interview on her old network, RT, which has also been deemed fake news, uh, which has been rec uh, cited recently in a US intelligence report, which was meant to be this damning condemnation of how Russia affected the election, which contained zero evidence of anything. And the last one is Black Pigeon Speaks, who um, I contribute to the Black Pigeon Speaks website, so he's sort of a boss, really, kind of. <laughs> but um, basically these clips show you how ridiculous the mainstream media narratives are these days. So without any ado, Paul Joseph Watson. Having lost the election and lost the argument, the butthurt left and the rigged media is desperate to salvage some scrap of credibility. So they've decided to create a new panic over so-called fake news, pressuring Google and Facebook to take action against fake news websites. Oh, and when they say fake news, that includes any reporting or opinion that contradicts their leftist narrative. The blacklist that all the mainstream media websites are circulating as the official designation of what constitutes fake news includes Infowars and Breitbart. Well, imagine my shock. But this list of fake news websites, it had to be created by a reasoned, level-headed, impartial source. There can't be any bias involved in this, right? Wrong. It was created by a radical leftist safe space social justice warrior assistant professor who describes herself as a feminist activist and who supports extreme left-wing groups like Black Lives Matter and Occupy Wall Street. Well, imagine my shock. So the media is circulating a list of fake news websites created by an incredibly biased left-wing social justice warrior, which just by coincidence is full of conservative news websites and then demanding Google and Facebook censor that content. This is all happening while Twitter also mass purges so-called alt-right accounts for daring to express unauthorized opinions. They're also promoting a Chrome browser extension that automatically flags so-called fake news websites based on this same SJW-created blacklist. And imagine my shock! Infowars.com is on that list. Listen, we all know that there are actual fake news websites. They're pretty easy to spot. And some of them even admit that they're fake news websites. But there's a difference between fake news stories like this and having a conservative opinion. And anyway, 
Who gave the mainstream media the right to be judge, jury and executioner of what constitutes fake news? All you do is put out fake news. You're the aficionados of fake news. You put out the fake news that Hillary Clinton was 98% likely to win the presidency. You printed out and shipped copies of Newsweek celebrating Madame President. You said the Cubs had a smaller chance of winning than Donald Trump. You put out fake rigged polls that were proven spectacularly wrong. You put out fake rape stories that ruin people's lives over and over again. You fake interviews with your own cameramen claiming they're anti-Trump protesters. You create fake narratives like Trump being responsible for violence at his own rallies when it was DNC funded agitators all along. By this measure, nearly every mainstream media outlet should be put on a fake news list. Oh yeah, and when some fake news website puts out a fake news story, the worst case scenario is that someone makes some ill-gotten advertising dollars. When the mainstream media peddles fake news, like the fake news story that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, hundreds of thousands of people die. You're the fucking experts at fake news, so how dare you accuse us of being fake news? And why the hell should anyone trust you? As WikiLeaks exposed, you're not the fourth estate, you're a public relations front for the Democratic Party. You lost the argument. You trashed your own credibility. And now you're trying to resurrect it by claiming that everyone who beat you is fake news. Give me a break. No one trusts you. That's why you have to resort to dirty tricks and censorship. And it's not going to work. Because you suck. You lie. And everyone knows now that you're fake news. It does raise some interesting questions how a very, very left-wing professor was able to write a list slandering all the right-wing conservative outlets as fake news and the mainstream media just ran with it. Um, But, of course, they're not great ones for fact-checking these days, as will be shown by the next clip, um, which is an RT interview with Abby Martin as uh, not only was RT mentioned uh, in the l- latest uh, inte- U.S. intelligence report, um, report about Russian interference in the U.S. election, but she was cited in it as uh, a contributing factor. Even though her show finished two years ago, she's mentioned by name in the report, but I'll let her tell the story. Well, RT gets quite the starring role in the U.S. intelligence reports. Almost a third of it is dedicated to describing RT's alleged efforts to, quote, fuel discontent in the U.S. It goes on to accuse some former programs of being overwhelmingly critical of American and Western governments for years. Well, let's now, in fact, hear from Abby Martin, who was the host of one of the name shows Breaking the Sets. Abby, nice to see you again. It's been a while, though, hasn't it? Uh, your show has not been running on RT for, what, two years now, yet it was still one of the programs singled out in the U.S. intelligence report, as we said you weren't shy, were you, to uh, to express your views, but is it fair to say that what you did here in RT was part of the Kremlin's effort to, quote, influence <laughs> politics and what they're saying also fuel discontent? It's incredible. You know, I've never actually gotten direction from Putin himself or coordinated with the Kremlin, but I will say as a passionate young American at the time that RT picked me up, uh, I was trying to present issues that affected Americans and their communities like reporters in a vibrant democracy should be able to do. So, you know, this whole report just reeks of desperation. It's lashing out on behalf of the establishment. It's lashing out on behalf of the establishment. Like you said, a third of it is full of bashing RT. It is absolutely insane, ridiculous, embarrassing to say the least. Um, Following the report, the New York Times issued an article with its own analysis of RT's work, again mentioning you, saying that you quit on air after denouncing Russia's actions in Ukraine. But there was a sizable period before that. 
Absolutely. I mean, here's the thing is that I've always been open with with management. I talked to my management about what I wanted to say. Um, I went on air, voiced my opinion. Um, and that's what I did every day. I voiced my opinions and I continue to voice my opinions after that. So the New York Times is no stranger to false narratives. Um, they latched onto this report. Not only did they call it surprisingly damning and detailed, they also had to add that, of course, it contained no evidence. But the next day after they published this, you know, staunch defense of the intelligence community, like it always does, so-called paper of record, um, they actually followed up with a piece claiming that two anchors quit live on air and denounced RT as propaganda. Of course, that is completely false. They didn't even reach out to me. Um, and, and I was a main part of this story to bolster this narrative in order to defend the intelligence report. So I was really, really appalled to see not only was I was my entire work on RT misconstrued to fit this narrative, but they hadn't even bothered to reach out to me. I mean, I'm pretty available online. So um, they said that I quit on air, denounced the propaganda. As we know, um, someone named Liz Wall, who tried to hijack um, what I was doing to reassert my editorial control, she actually did quit on air. Um, and, and, you know, when you dig into that story, it has uh, full of holes as well. So it's pretty desperate what they were trying to do. And when I approached the guy, um, it was already up for 19 hours with mm. thousands of people seeing these lies, these egregious lies about me and my reporting. And it really contradicted their entire story. The truth contradicted their story because when I pointed out, hey, not only did I not quit on air, not only was I able to speak out, but I was able to have my job for an entire year after that continuing to speak out. And that that completely shows, hey, if this is a Kremlin mouthpiece, why was I able to have the main opinion show on primetime television on RT for an entire year after that happened? Have you heard from the author of the article at all? Because as we understand, they made a correction to the original publication, but again, got it wrong. Of course. Um, I confronted him after it was up for almost a day. And mind you, there were other people telling him that this was full of egregious um, factual inconsistencies. He didn't care. They didn't retract or, or correct it at all. It was only when I put him on blast, Russell Goldman on Twitter, that he immediately corrected it. OK, so it was a, it was a series of corrections here <laughs> happening in real time because they were very embarrassed and desperate to try to maintain this narrative that I somehow quit over the Ukraine thing. Right. So I told him, hey, that actually isn't true. Um, I issued a statement. Their correction still misconstrued the facts. Shockingly enough, at the at the end of their correction, they say Abby Martin quit sometime after, right? Not mentioning that it was an entire year. <laughs> so they still insinuate that I quit over this political disagreement, which couldn't be farther from the truth. Many news outlets from all over the world, they're, really, they're constantly accusing Russia of producing fake news. It's a term we've heard a lot about in the last month or so. But uh, surely the New York Times has done exactly that in its reporting on you and its reporting as well on Russian hackers breaking into the U.S. electrical grid, which they then corrected two days later. Where is this coming from in American media in particular? Well, the New York Times and the Washington Post, it's, it's quite astounding. I mean, they're the so-called paper of record. They set the narrative for the beltway. You know, they're, they're echoed and repeated and bolstered by the establishment um, and so forth. But really, when you look at these two publications, they are the premier um, producers of, quote unquote, fake news, producing um, false narratives and, and much more dangerous, let's say, than, than the fake news that Washington Post pointed out um, when they're trying to conflate all non-corporate media as somehow fake. Um, it's much more dangerous when you look at the New York Times' history, where they had to issue a mea culpa on behalf of Judith Miller for literally selling the Iraq war several, several times. Also during 2003, you look at they were bolstering this ridiculous narrative about Iraq trying to issue a hacking Scam. Saddam was trying to launch a hacking on um, during that run up. So they were using that narrative too. the North Korea hack um, from Sony. All of these things are completely insane. The New York Times. Look, let's be honest. It works on behalf of the establishment. It is the state propaganda that we should be worried about. And when people go to the New York Times for the truth and what it is telling you and what it is desperate to sell a narrative that is gaining hostility and confrontation with a nuclear state when we should be coordinating and cooperating with Russia to combat actual threats in the world. This is an embarrassment and people should actually go and issue an apology. 
Just to get your thought on this as well, Abby, the, the intelligence report states that RT was critical of fracking in the US and that third party debates were used to create some kind of influence on the issue. Now, perhaps more of a surprise is the focus on RT building up its social media platform, which the report claimed is proof that the channel is a Kremlin propaganda tool. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you hit that you hit the most important point right there. So here's what the report details. It, it doesn't even really detail. Oh, RT talks about Putin. RT talks about Trump. Really, what it focused on, and here here's the most amazing part. It focused on fracking, Occupy Wall Street, Wall Street greed. It talked about how fomenting radical discontent was simply covering third parties. So basically, what the report is saying, and this is amazing because it shows you what these people really think behind closed doors, and they thought that somehow publishing it would be okay when really. What it shows is that they are the most scared of real reporting. These are issues that Americans care about. These are issues that affect our lives. And when you mock environmental issues as somehow a Kremlin conspiracy, that's the level of discourse that we're at. You know, in the, in the, in the hacked, uh, the, the DNC leaks, Hillary was scoffing at environmentalists. She was actually calling anti-fracking activists a tool of the Kremlin as well. So this is where we're at in society, where the establishment actually is so threatened by people talking about Wall Street greed that they are willing to go out on a limb and say that this is all being fomented by the Kremlin. It is a bizarre world, and I will say it is a post post-truth reality that they are actually construing themselves. And let's be honest what this is really about. This is not about Russia as some sort of threat to anyone except capitalism and U.S. hegemony and supremacy around the world. And that's why we're going to be see a lot of confrontation and hostility toward Russia and China in the coming years because they need to maintain their stranglehold. The empire needs to maintain its stranglehold over that region of the world. Abby, thanks for coming on the show and clarifying your position. Good to see you back on screen as well with RT for the moment. Abby Martin, former host of Breaking the Sets. The oh, Abby Martin has said on a number of interviews, she wish, wishes her show was so powerful that even though it was finished two years ago, it had such a major effect. And that nobody bothered fact-checking with her reminds me of... Um, reminds me of a... St- story of uh, the former UK ambassador that works with WikiLeaks that will be mentioned in the next clip um, where he claimed to know who the um, person who leaked the DNC emails and say leaked not hacked um, and it wasn't Russia were a Russian agent and um, no one had contacted him in the media to ask him about it they were just running with this neuro- uh, narrative of Russian hacking. Now, the final clip is by Black Pigeon Speaks, who whose video productions is amazing. You know, I can't, sh- of course, show you over radio, but um, do go and check out his um, uh, YouTube channel and uh, the Black Pigeon Speaks website where you'll find the show and many other interesting articles and videos. The multinational conglomerates, the banking cartels, and their bought government are all getting scared. The mouthpiece for their system of control, the mainstream media, is hemorrhaging. And the fear that the professional sports addled, prescription drug addicted, television droned, Walmart shopping, credit card debt holding, zombified population might be slowly awaking from their slumber is terrifying. Trust in the controlled media has been smashed in 2016 and in a last desperate gambit they've pulled their last rabbit out of their proverbial hat thrown up the smoke screen and mirrors and called it fake news she had the corporations with her she had hollywood behind her she had the tech companies and the banking cartels the international corporations the military industrial complex she had the democratic party as well as the republican party behind her and she still lost and It's this guy's fault, or so the mainstream controlled media would like you to believe. And they keep on repeating it ad infinitum, thinking that if they keep saying it over and over, not only will people believe it, but it will make it so. Funny how they seem to have not picked up on the fact that former British ambassador Craig Murray, who works with WikiLeaks, has categorically stated the hacked emails from Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, John Podesta, did not come from or connected to 
anyone in Russia in any way, but were in fact leaked by a Washington insider. But this doesn't matter. They've already created the smokescreen, and anyone who says different is peddling fake news. We know. What the WikiLeaks dump uh, makes clear is how the sausage is made in politics. And I think it's interesting just on that level. Also interesting is, remember, it's illegal to possess uh, these stolen documents. It's different for the media. So everything you learn about this, you're learning from us. And in full disclosure, let's take a look at what is in there and what it means. Joining us now, CNN. Fake news is this year's hot buzzword, and it would seem that governments and corporations are starting to get worried. Fake news is, of course, out there. You see it all the time on social media as well as across the Internet and your TV screens. The problem is, where does quote-unquote real news end and the quote-unquote fake news begin? Let's remember that the whole fake news hot-button issue that the controlled media is now using to justify its own existence began during the 2016 election cycle, where the whole reeking edifice was shown to the world as the banking and corporate-owned mouthpiece that it is. Also, and not so coincidentally, the hysteria surrounding fake news began with just slight lag, but almost simultaneously with the investigation into allegations that have been collectively labeled Pizzagate. You also see the entire apparatus of the controlled media, as well as Hollywood and their controlled minions called celebrities, Well, they're all also out to discredit the allegations before the investigation ever even really began. What 2016, if nothing else, will be remembered as the year that many of those who for generations have been sedated by the controlled media woke up and saw it for the control mechanism that it really is. Even the vaunted and lauded New York Times realizing that their blatant partisanship in the 2016 election cycle was so extreme and as a result has seen its subscription base hemorrhage has had to crawl down on its knees, acknowledge their bias and failure to report accurately, and have begged forgiveness for destroying its public trust. Get used to this term. You're going to be hearing about it a lot. Fake news is whatever the corporate-controlled media or government tells you it is. So that is to say, we have actually reached a post-truth society. Facts no longer matter. When facts no longer matter, communication is all but impossible, as witnessed by the 2016 election cycle. Don't want to have people talk about it? Call it fake news. Case in point. On the 17th of December 2016, Phoenix Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio has stated that his five years worth of investigatory information would be turned over to Congress. And it shows categorically that the birth certificate produced by President Barack Obama is a forgery. He doesn't, however, dispute Barack Obama's birthplace. What he has stated is that there is clear and convincing proof that the certification was a fraudulently manufactured document. But as you'd guess, the controlled media is not picking it up. CNN, Time, MSNBC, and a host of others refuse to report on this very newsworthy item. It's been reported by a few outfits, the USA Today and a couple of European websites like The Independent out of Ireland, as well as across the alternative media. And speaking of Europe, never a bastion of freedom of speech or conscience, Germany is also now getting involved in the so-called fake news. Trying to keep a lid on the crime infestation and tidal wave of violence and rape that Angela Merkel has willfully and gleefully imported with her call for all of Africa and the Middle East to come to Germany and live off state benefits, the chairman of Germany's Social Democratic Party, Thomas Opperman, has suggested a new law that would require companies like Facebook to set up an office in the country that would deal with fake news and, of course, the other buzzword, hate speech at all hours of the day. According to the English language version of the German news site Deutsche Welle, German legislators are considering whether to institute a policy that if Facebook's local office did not delete the news item or hate speech within 24 hours, the social network could expect a fine of 500,000 euros per item. Now remember, in today's Germany, as well as most of the rest of Europe, hate speech is basically anything the government says it is. Not wanting your town overwhelmed by migrants is hate speech. Not wanting your children raped is hate speech. Calling a Muslim in the act of mass murder a wanker is hate speech. And thus, whatever the government deems to be hate speech is in fact 
fake news. And it is clamping down hard on people's ability to gain information on the reality of and outcome of government policies that affect them in their daily lives. So let's be clear, this push against so-called fake news is being used by governments for the sole reason of coming down on and rooting out dissent. While Americans may scoff at Germany and Europeans in general for their lack of freedom, they may not be smiling for long. In the great American tradition of tacking on appropriation and spending for projects onto larger authorizations, And in the spirit of bipartisanship, Senator Rob Portman, Republican from Ohio, who is owned by Investment Banking, and Chris Murphy, Democrat from Connecticut, whose largest campaign contributor is the George Soros-backed MoveOn.org, co-sponsored the Countering Disinformation and Propaganda Act. And without fanfare... It slipped through by tacking it on to the fiscal year 2017 National Defense Authorization Act and has already passed the Senate. Its stated goal is to improve the ability of the United States to counter foreign propaganda and disinformation by establishing an interagency center housed at the State Department to coordinate and synchronize counter propaganda efforts throughout the U.S. government. To support these efforts, the bill also creates a grant program for NGOs, think tanks, civil society, and other experts outside the government who are engaged in counter-propaganda related work. This will better leverage existing expertise and empower local communities to defend themselves from foreign manipulation. Or in layman's terms, state is creating a propaganda department with large grants available to think tanks and other groups that parasitically live off the largesse of Washington in the revolving door of lobbyists and government. Or, basically, the United States government has created a ministry of truth to decide on what news is real and what news will be called fake. They openly boast about paying journalists as well as media organizations, among others, to identify so-called disinformation and engage in counter-propaganda. The only blip about the U.S. government's new and official Department of Propaganda has been on a few alternative media sites. Nothing coming from the controlled media, fake news it would seem. But the act will greenlight the government's ability to crack down with impunity against any media organizations it deems propaganda. And it will also provide substantial amounts of money to fund an army of so-called local journalists counter-propaganda to make sure the government's own fake news drowns out that of the still free fringes or alternative media. The time for Americans to scoff at and laugh at the lack of freedom in Europe and Canada is over. The current controlled media hysteria with regards to fake news is nothing but a smokescreen and their last desperate attempt to put independent journalism back in the bottle and keep their comatose society zombified as they work out how to control the flow of information in the digital age. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, Basically, no one has to wait for a a TV network to send a camera crew down somewhere or a newspaper to send a photographer to get images of events. Everyone has a smartphone, well, not me, but everyone else seems to have a smartphone where they can just take high-definition pictures and record videos like the um, everyone questioning Hillary Clinton's health and people are, no, it's just a crazy conspiracy theory. And then there was who caught her collapsing at the 9-11 commemorations. So we might see an, an age where... The 6 o'clock TV news might not be a thing anymore. (laughs) But you know what will probably survive it? Radio, baby. Like Planet FM. There's a sign on our wall. says, tell your audience you can hear our programs anytime at www.planetaudio.org.nz. You can listen to our program streaming live right now. And, of course... Check out our, check out other radio stations. Um, you can download the shows. It's like podcasts, but that get broadcast over radio waves as well. And of course, get a radio. One day, it might save your life. 
uh, one of the batteries or the one one you can hand hand wind in case there's a civil defence emergency and of course the internet is down. You might just receive information that will save your life or that of a loved one. Next week's show will be on Trump's inauguration and uh, the show after that will be an interview with a Canadian academic um, about some really scary stuff going on in Canada. Okay, until next time, look after yourselves.